Okay, we can start now, right here. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure for me to reintroduce uh, Ivan Sullen. His name used to be Ike. Uh, we were classmates, and that's how we met. And uh, that was 70 years ago. <laughs> so that sort of dates both of us. One, one thing uh, about Ike when we had classes together, he always knew how to solve the damn problems, uh, even before the teacher did, I think. And uh, that, that ruined the curve when it came to grading. But uh, he, he was very good at, at solving the problems at you know, sophomore, junior, senior year. But uh, he went on in life to be able to solve all sorts of problems. His, uh, I, I hope you get to read his, his bio. It's uh, absolutely fabulous. And part of that, of course, was his uh, term as uh, uh, chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, under several administrations. And when I worked at the lab, uh, I spent a lot of time on NRC problems and projects, and I never could figure out how all that stuff came together. And uh, the fact that, that Ike is going to come here and tell us about how to maybe solve this type of problem for the uh, NRC, says our energy problem. Uh, he also uh, went to all sorts of different government and uh, non-government uh, organizations and took the lead and solved their problems for them. So we're hoping to have a, a, a nice uh, discussion <clears throat> with uh, both uh, questions and answers for different aspects of the, uh, of the problems he's going to talk about. So uh, please don't be bashful when it comes to uh, discussing stuff. Okay? There we go. Thank you, Sid. I don't know if any of you have had anything to do with the Defense Department, the State Department, or the NRC, but none of them is famous for all the solved problems that have been solved. So uh, I'm not sure I've solved any problems since I was an undergraduate, but I have worked on some interesting issues. Anyhow, uh, the, the goal of this talk today will require a little bit of imagination and a lot of participation. I would like you to imagine we just elected a president whose declaratory policy is that uh, nuclear power has a major role to play in providing clean, carbon-free electricity uh, for the world. And this uh, president has hired a terrific secretary of the energy who's come up with a lot of good ideas. And now they are turning to the regulatory world and they're trying to imagine uh, what would be the proper framework uh, for regulating all these ideas. They can range from you know, the traditional ones, how do you build a thousand uh, megawatt reactor quickly, safely, and uh, economically down to what kind of regulation seems appropriate for some of the low pressure things that people are talking about. I, I want to make it clear that this is a Socratic conversation. Um, what Sid didn't say is I've had three federal jobs and in every one of the jobs, the people who worked for me knew more than I did about the subject. And whatever success I had was in the ability to get people talking and exchanging ideas and coming up with things that they didn't even know they knew about. And I'd like to try to do the same thing today because nothing will come up today on which I know more than everybody in the room. I guarantee you that. So it's uh, if I can do anything useful, it will be to encourage people to trade ideas and maybe come up with some uh, new approaches. And then the third thing, as far as the general conversation, um, is uh, this is not, I don't, I'm not looking for incremental discussions. I'm not the right person for that. I'm not looking for how can we do this particular approach a little bit better than we're doing today. Every now and then it's useful to sit back and say, okay, picture it's 20 years from now. I mean, for some of us, that takes a huge amount of uh, confidence and imagination, but nevertheless, picture it's 20 years from now. And what will I wish I had done 20 years ago so that I don't regret that today. In other words, 
try, try to stand back and say, what would an ideal regulatory environment look like for the kinds of technologies that would likely flourish in a world in which people, uh, economists, investors, government regulators, were convinced that, or are convinced that there's a strong role for them? nuclear generated electricity in uh, controlling climate change. So that's basically the, the uh, output. If you're going to ask me a question about some specific regulation and how it ought to be changed, I'm sorry, but you've got the wrong, the wrong person for that. But if we can talk a little bit about how, say, a molten salt reactor, which operates at uh, low uh, pressure, might require a different approach from the approach that's been honed on pressurized water, uh, reactors for the last uh, basically 50 years, uh, then maybe we'll have something to talk about. Um, I, I, there's, there's an article that uh, uh, we'll put a link on the on the website at some point. It's by a man named Matthew Iglesias. It's called Unleash the Power of Bi Bipartisan NRC Reform. I just suggest you might want to take a look at that. It's not a prerequisite for the conversation. But it doesn't go anywhere near as far as I want to go in the conversation today. But as far as it does go, which is some changes in the NRC uh, mission, really, I 100% agree with the things that Matthew is, uh, is talking about. So that's just the useful uh, piece of uh, background. Okay, so first question in, well, Sid talked a lot about solving problems. First question is to know what kind of, what are the problems that we're talking about? I, I would really treasure hearing your views on this. Mine are very simplistic. The, there, there seem to me to be two major problems. One is that it's just too expensive to build nuclear plants of the current high pressure technology, the very high pressure pressurized water reactors and the boiling water reactors as well. It costs too much. Uh, there's, not, there's not a sufficient learning curve. We're not, we don't, aren't getting better at it. Uh, and that's a major problem to solve. I'll come back to that a little bit in a bit. And the second thing is that there are some very promising technologies. I, I know this is a uh, hotbed a bit of interest in the uh, in the molten salt reactors. These are low pressure reactors. All of the NRC's experience is regulating high pressure reactors. I don't actually know what they're doing today, but I suspect they're having trouble making the transition from uh, one world to a completely different technological approach. And I'd like to get your views on what would be a, a, a proper approach um, to uh, regulating low pressure reactors, in particular, the molten salt reactor. But maybe somebody will talk about the pebble bed reactor or some other technology I don't really know much about. Um, uh, why such an interest in low pressure? My own view is that the high pressure architecture makes safety intrinsically expensive, even if you do everything right. You just, uh, well, there are enough nods in the room. Most of them are this way instead of that way. So I'll assume that I don't have to spend much time on that. So uh, I think it's reasonable to expect serious investment and government backing if you accept my stipulation that there is a conviction that there's a role, a big role for nuclear power and electricity generating. So I really do want to spend some time, and I like to spend it from the point of view of what don't you have to do if you don't have high pressure as opposed to what are the specifics of a, a, a particular reactor design. But I'm hoping that's what you folks will do. Um, we ought to start with the regulatory mission. You, you know, the obvious point, but sort of it seems not to have been practiced for, for 50 years, maybe since I was NRC chairman, maybe even before that, is a clear observation that you can't just reduce risk without also reducing benefit. That the mission of any agency, which is to reduce risk, has to be to produce a certain amount of benefit, or the agency's uh, solution will be to close down the industry. This uh, sounds sort of obvious. Um, it's not impossible to do. I mean, take a look at the Fed. The, the, the Fed does five different things, but as far as monetary policy and regulation, uh, they, their charge is to promote stable prices, to maximize employment, and to moderate interest rates. I think overall, they do a fairly good job, maybe a very good job, at weighing these things. So a regulatory agency can weigh uh, risks and benefits and pay attention to both. But uh, 
Uh, even the FAA does more. Now, they're much more complicated because they have so many operations. So I'm not exactly holding them up as our model, but I do want to point out that here's another safety regulation, regulatory agency, which also has a promotional, well, which has a promotional responsibility, and they do. I mean, civil aviation is blossom. It's <clears throat> gotten cheaper and cheaper and more and more in there and safer and safer. So it's possible to regulate a very tricky area uh, taking into account both, uh, uh, both costs and benefits. And uh, there is a bill right now. It's, um, I have to read the citation. I don't go to sleep uh, knowing House, uh, house uh, bills. This is H.R. 6544. It's called the Atomic Energy Advancement Act, uh, which I personally strongly support. And it, it says very well what the, the uh, issue is. The objective is that nuclear, I mean, I've dropped some words. What I'm saying is a quote, but I'm not including all the language in the quote. The nuclear energy activity should be conducted in a manner that is efficient and does not unnecessarily, unnecessarily limit, one, the potential of nuclear energy to improve the general welfare, which we read as producing uh, uh, cheap and readily available electricity with a minimum uh, safety impact and a minimum uh, contribution to carbon in the atmosphere, and two, that benefits uh, that increases the benefits of nuclear energy technology to society. This is a, I mean, it's a pretty vague statement, but at least it gives people who care a lot about saying, look, our mission is to worry about um, making sure nuclear energy is safe, but it, that it's also uh, affordable, that it can be used widely, and that it can produce the goods, the good that is potential in it. In other words, that even a society that invests heavily in in wind and in uh, solar and in geothermal understands that uh, no one or even no several set of modes is a full solution and that we think nuclear energy should be a part of that. Okay, compare that with the current NRC, the NRC's current ALARA standard. Uh, ALARA, of course, is as low as reasonably achievable, which means making every reasonable effort to maintain exposure to ionizing radiation as far below those limits as consistent with the purpose for which the license activity is undertaken, taking into account the state of technology. I'm sorry it's so long, but you really have to hear this. The economics of improvements in relation to the state of technology, the economics of improvement in relation to the benefits of public health and safety, and other societal, societal and socioeconomic considerations and in relation to utilization of nuclear energy and licensed materials in the public interest. So it's not so much the, the uh, statement in our, uh, in our regulation, it's really that uh, the NRC and the commission, and which was true when I was chairman, and as far as I know is still true now, puts an overwhelming uh, emphasis on the first line, which basically tells the staff, you know, make it a little bit tougher if, if it can be done, uh, it's in the interest, even if it may not reduce risk all that much, even if it may not make electricity more uh, nuclear generated electricity more widely available. I believe that the NRC focuses almost exclusively on as far below the dose, the dose limits as practical without the rest of that long nuanced statement. And certainly without explicitly calculating the costs to the public health and safety of proposed regulations. EPA, with analogous statutory languages, seems to me to try to find appropriate balances in most cases. So the first thing, if you wanted to create a truly uh, balanced, nuanced regulatory environment that allows the appropriate uh, promotion for nuclear energy while, while uh, guarding all kinds of safety interests, you have to start with the NRC's mission statement. That's as far as I'm going to go. I don't have a draft of the statement. The the statement in this uh, house, uh, this house bill is probably about as good as you can get. But uh, let's see what happens. The second major theoretical uh, uh, question I want to look at is something that Ellen raised in chatting with me. Uh, it's uh, I'll call it the modus operandi, the the MO, and that's risk versus risk regulation versus process regulation. The NRC has the reputation of being process-oriented, 
Does the design provide triple redundancy? Does it meet all of the instructions that we've done, et cetera? Rather than risk-oriented, what is the probability of failure in reviewing designs and material condition? When I was chairman, I tried to shift the emphasis to risks. I tell the truth, I don't know how that has fared since then. But it's hard, you know, uh, to, to really uh, regulate purely on a risk basis, you'd have to know an awful lot of things that I don't think people know to have, you know, really good models of what contributes to risk and how changes in physical condition might affect that. So it's nice to state an, accept, an acceptable level of risk and then design the reactor system to stay within that risk. But in practice, it's very difficult to design to given levels of risk. There's just too many components involved, too many calculations, too many scenarios. So I believe a compound system is required. Design individual components as carefully as possible, then simulate the risks in the overall design to a range of threats. In fact, probably a negative approach would be uh, very productive, which is to go the other way around. Take each regulation and say, does this contribute to reducing risk in the case that I care about? If it's a regulation that was written for PWRs and we're trying to apply it to multiple, um, sorry, to molten uh, salt reactors, what is, what do we really care about how much water we keep on the core? Are there other things that we can be looking at? But doing a positive risk evaluation is very tough. In other words, saying what contributes to risk, but it's not so tough to do the opposite, which is to go through regulations one by one and saying, show me how this contributes to reducing risk. And if it doesn't, then the, the onus is on the, um, uh, on the agency to keep the procedure, not on uh, the public or the industry to prove that it's not uh, necessary. Uh, there's also, there's a lot of stuff. I hope you guys are taking notes because I'm really looking for questions about this afterwards. Not everybody saying, oh, that was interesting. Now let's have lunch. If you do that, I, I will have wasted a trip and a, and a flight home into the hurricane for, for not much to show for it. Uh, the second issue is also an MO issue, which is to separate licensing of design from approval of the site. Now, um, I'm not completely up to date on this either, but my impression is that this is not too bad, that there has been a lot of pro uh, progress made to, um, to uh, approve of, of site and a reactor for that site. <clears throat> and then the design of the reactor doesn't have to be re-legislated each time it's designed for another site. But is it satisfactory? Um, um, uh, let me go back to cost control of construction. Um, there are a lot of smart people who have done a lot of careful economic analysis of why do uh, reactors cost them so much to build and the third and the fourth and the fifth one don't seem to cost less than the first one. Um, a lot of people have many opinions, but the one thing that's very clear is the learning curves that we're used to looking out for come from factory construction. That uh, you know, new houses aren't all that much cheaper to build than other new houses if they're stick built on the, on the site. The real savings, the real learning curve comes if you can do more and more in the factory under controlled conditions to a regulation that says, here's how it has to be, uh, it has to be done. And in order to do that, you really have to say, I'm approving the reactor apart uh, from the site and apart or in addition to the overall uh, piece. Uh, can we do that? Can it be done? Um, there are some ideas with modular reactors, for instance, they take this to an extreme case of, of building, a, say, a 300 megawatt pressurized water reactor, burying it into what amounts to a slab and not building a separate containment so that really even the site could be engineered in advance. Is this feasible? Is it a good idea? Uh, what kind of regulatory world? would make that attractive. If we're gonna regulate it as if it were a stick-built reactor, why bother? Okay, now some specific questions. You know, I'm a very good grandparent. I got a lot of questions, but <laughs> not many answers. So the grandchildren love that. So. Okay. Uh, first of all, what changes in practice would be necessary to support cost control in the construction of monoreactors. Uh, let me just get my notes in the right place. 
For instance, consider if a modification in regulatory philosophy might be appropriate for site-specific reactors. Uh, is the regulatory burden any less than something like reopening Three Mile Island with a local uh, generation of electricity that don't don't where the electricity doesn't have to go on the grid? I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, there's a negative side, which is if you're on the grid, you automatically have at least some access to backup electricity. If you have an accident, if you're going to make a site-specific site, you've got to really pay attention to locally available backup electricity. I I don't know. Does it or not? Have you thought about it? Somebody have something to say about that? How about uh, factory-built modular small reactors? Um, what would a regulatory regime look like that would basically say it's the same technology, but it's a complete different uh, application? We're, we're doing factory build and we're going to build the same reactor. Maybe it would even encourage, you know, more configuration control, um, which the French have somehow done and we haven't. Sid, Sid's heard this many times, but when I was NRC chairman, I really liked the French. I liked their program. I liked everything about it. And I was the only one in the NRC who did like the French. So they were sort of fond of me at the same time. Uh, one reason is my French is pretty good. I went to school in France. But the second was because of my favorite joke, and it was, you know, you have to hand it to the French. Uh, they have two kinds of reactors and hundreds of kinds of cheeses. And in America, it's the other way around. So <laughs> they liked it. I got a nasty letter from the Wisconsin Dairy Association <laughs> at some point. The, the, the utilities couldn't complain. I was their regulator, but the, the dairy guys did. Anyhow, there's a lot to be said for configuration control. It seems that if you make reactors in a factory instead of building at the site, there are many, many stronger incentives and many fewer challenges. So it would be a good thing from a safety and from a cost point of view to encourage factory uh, construction. But what does that mean for the regulatory environment? Uh, uh, the third uh, is uh, what would be necessary for uh, regulating basically a general class of low pressurized reactors, low pressure reactors. Now, I know you can take a specific design like somebody's MSR and say, what's appropriate for regulating that? I was hoping there might be some discussion more generally of what is there in the regs and what is there in the philosophy that's just unnecessary in a world of low pressure uh, reactors, be they molten salt or pebble bed or something I haven't thought about. Um, I do also understand that uh, you all and people that you work with, uh, the concept of building uh, the uh, molten salt reactor in the shipyard, which would be someplace between stick built and factory built. I don't know anything about that. It seems like it would have some interesting possibilities also for, uh, for regulation. Maybe some of you would like to talk about that. There are concepts for putting uh, molten, uh, molten salt reactors on actually on barges and using them in, uh, in um, more backward areas. I don't know if there's a chance of doing that or not. I've heard an awful lot of people saying, we'd love to get the first reactors authorized someplace where the NRC doesn't work so we could come and show uh, the Americans this does work. I don't know. Um, that's basically what I, the, that's the agenda that I'm trying to say. I've taken 20 minutes of 60 to try to set an agenda. And at this point, I'd like to sit back and hope there'll be something other than deafening silence to go on with the conversation. Please. Well, I was just questioning the need for very large, very large uh, power sources when you have small ones which can be distributed where they're needed because you've got this tremendous loss of power on the wire keeping 30 feet more. And I just... Why are we still thinking in large terms? Extra uh, my impression is there are people thinking in all terms. There are people thinking in large terms and there are people thinking in small terms. How small are you talking about? Is it 300 megawatts large by what you're, you're talking about? 20, 50? Well, I mean, oh, the size of a, a big turbine or, or how small? Well, the way I look at it, I, I'm not an engineer, but I would say county-wide. A unit which would serve a county? I don't know. I mean, 
the NRC isn't going to push these things. They, they're they really trying to react and say, if there's a demand for these, what would be the appropriate <laughs> regulatory environment? So um, as being your quasi NRC person here, I would not try to answer that. I would basically ask around and say, is, is something going to happen there? Do we as regulators need to prepare for this? Or is it a lower priority than uh, than other things? It's a really good question for the Department of Energy. It's not so much a question for the NRC unless you think that uh, it is something that has to that has to be prepared for. Yes. Please. Um, my name is Charles Berger, and I'm not a PhD. I worked some at the lab. Started my career years ago at Y12, moved to General Electric, was trained in nuclear plant services, both for the PWR and the BWR systems, and uh, came back to the lab at the high flux isotope reactor. So, anyway, I've been given a lot of thought to your discussion. In fact, you have tracked my progress. I'm, I've looked at the molten salt reactors, I've looked at the light water reactors, and of course, all of my failures with light water reactors have been steam explosions, not nuclear. And the problem there is we have more and more problems keeping the water chemistry right, especially from an intergranular stress corrosive problems in the stainless pipe. We're starting to understand that. In fact, I've been out of the business since 95, so. But, uh, and things have moved along. But I've always looked at the molten salt reactors because of the low pressure uh, and building them into a factory at about 300 megawatt size, three to 400, designing the components completely in a model and making that model fit every site because we actually, in the nuclear business, created our Achilles heel back in the 50s when we announced it would be too cheap to monitor. And everyone was sold that idea that this was going to be cheap, and then every utility went out. When they ordered a new BWR from General Electric or Westinghouse a PWR, they wanted their own plant. They didn't want it like John Lowe over the hill had. They wanted to, if you go to Brown's Ferry, even though they're built off the same drawings as Peach Bottom, you can't find valves in Brown's Ferry where they are at Peach Bottom. And you can't take the same operators and you, you got you all the benefits that you don't have. Or anything. So if you go back and look, I started out my career in weapons, okay, and was very involved with the, with the Air Force and how they handled like their jet engines for their fighters. They put out a design requirement and Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, and some others would build a jet engine and then they would compete. The one that won the, com the competition would get 60% of the fabrication and the other was deal it up between the others. So they would actually have backup sources for that engine the one of them would fell it up. And, and they're all the same. So the turbine fan built here with the turbine fan over well, there. While you're on that topic, I would just like to, about the engines, not the yeah. comparability. Uh, when I was at the Defense Department, which is an amazingly long time ago, it was around 69 and 70, uh, we had a wonderful assistant secretary of defense for installations and logistics. His name is Paul Ignatius. He's the father of the columnist from the Washington Post, who you, you may know. And he really pushed the defense preparedness. It wanted multiple sources for everything that we did. But that's, you know, basically for the last 30 years, that's been abandoned in favor of a just-in-time environment. You know, if we need one, we'll make one, not, not, not pay to have two or three. Um, these are huge problems. My question is more if the society... Posit, you know, just stipulate, make believe the society is ready to solve those problems. That's what I try to say at the beginning. What would you do in the regulatory environment to react to that and furthermore to further encourage, uh, well, uh, encourage that? 
I think the regulatory department should decide what type of reactor we're going with and limit that reactor completely. Now, if I need an alternator for my car, I can go down and get an alternator, right? And it fits right on, bolts right on, no problem. So you would suggest that the regulator have more authority to set a standard configuration for a particular kind of uh, reactor and that anybody who wanted to sell such a reactor would have to meet that spec. Exactly, exactly. And That's and pretty exciting, a, I mean. And you would build a, a reactor where you knew the wear points and if you go with the molten salt, you can use ring joint flanges rather than welded flanges. Well, well, let, let me make a suggestion. I'd like to hear your thought. I, I think that's sort of hopeless for pressurized water reactors. I mean, we've got too many people who've been around too long who've been doing it. But for the new technologies, maybe it's not hopeless. Do you think it would make some sense to say, I, the chairman of the NRC, uh, I'm going to try to approve a standardized uh, design or at least a standardized specification for multiple uh, salt, uh, salt reactors so that new ones would have standard components, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the competition would be on a given set of parameters. Is that, That's hey, is going that going a good going. idea? Is yeah, it hopeless? Because, Could it be done? Because you know the wear characteristics of every piece of pipe in that reactor. Well, let me ask you about that. Do we know? Maybe we do. I don't know. Do we, do we have an understanding of what happens to metals that are both subject to a huge amount of corrosion and a huge amount of radiation. Yes, and we and we have a very good knowledge of radiation hardening and problems with the grain structure of stainless steels. Uh, under high radiate, I mean, yeah, under highly corrosive situations. I'm sorry, um, I, I didn't understand. In, in highly corrosive situations, we know that? I don't, in what I would call highly corrosive situations such as molten salt, okay? But we do have an understanding, basically, what that would be. Now, that I understand. So and, and, but, wouldn't it be necessary if, I hope you take my interaction with you as a compliment, not as a, a correction, but would it, would it be necessary for, for the regulatory agents to say, in order to properly license this design, there has to be some additional research done on, you know, say, the, the simultaneous impact of corrosion and radiation on key components? I mean, well, would that now, be part of the regulator's job? Let's step back two steps, okay? Please. Let's, let's look at what we have of PMs. And when I worked with the EATER project, I proposed... I, I don't know the acronyms, I'm sorry. Okay, the, new, the fusion action, the fusion reactor that's being built in southern okay. France, okay? And then the uh, EATER people and Europe decided they didn't want a PM program, preventative maintenance program. We have techniques of monitoring electrical motors and they can tell you that drive motor is going to die in six months, okay? Right. Well, we could do the same thing with pipe erosion by monitoring the wall thickness externally. Let me ask you the, the same question again. Do we know how to do that in this world of combined corrosion and radiation? Yes. We do. We do. Okay. And so what we would do is we would pick out the pipe pieces that we know we have a lot of erosion rate in it and schedule preventative maintenance to replace those pipe pieces irregardless. You only look at the plant and how long it's been running, you can calculate exactly what that wall thickness yeah. is That's and change it out pre-failure. I, I wonder if other people, let's take a specific topic now, which is a sort of a, a new, wouldn't it be great regulatory philosophy for molten salt reactors or basically for any low pressure reactor, which is not currently in wide circulation. I'd like to hear if other people have points. I'm sure you all heard the famous systems analysis story about Abraham Wald, who was a, um, he was a statistician at Columbia during the Second War. The, Air, the Army Air Corps hired him to look at airplanes and tell them where they should be putting the armor, which is very expensive. It's heavy. 
And they said, oh, look, look at all the places that are shot up. They've got a lot of damage. We should armor those, right? He said, no, no, no. Those are the planes that are coming back. You want to you want to fix the planes, uh, the stuff that isn't shot up, because that's what's shooting airplanes down. So you're, you're suggesting, if I understand, uh, an, uh, um, a record keeping that finds out which pipes fail and where do they fail, and that's where the emphasis. I mean, this is clearly an idea of, <clears throat> sorry, of risk-oriented um, regulation. Does anybody else want to follow on this topic before we go to something else? Topic being a regulatory regime for uh, some kind of centralized, standardized molten salt reactors, please. So one of the things I'd like to interject here is what numbers does it take to achieve this? Take your example with airplanes being shot up. Right. How many airplanes are they flying? A Thousands lot. of right. them. And we talk in a lot of this, and, and similar with your concepts, you know which bends of the pipe by experience. Where do you get to the experience? I know you can do it by analysis and experience. No. But the one of those. But evaluation. But we can we can monitor the wall. But, the well, but that's experience. Oh, but okay, so that's a great point. Uh, here, here's here's something I would like to contribute, a completely off-the-wall piece of experience. When I was Assistant Secretary of Defense and Systems Analysis, my uh, my group had the uh, uh, the hubris or chutzpah, or depending on your ethnic background, there's some other word, to tell the Air Force how to design the F-15. And we said, we don't want two engines. You don't need two of everything. What you can do is go test a zillion components and find out what fails. So duplicate at the component level, not at the system level. Even with a small number of MSRs, could you do that with pipes and components? You wouldn't need hundreds of reactors to get hundreds of... Unless you're going to build many test facilities... Well, that's what I'm asking you. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't a serious regulator say, if you expect me to do risk, risk-oriented analysis for a novel reactor, I'm go I am going to require either that the government or the Promoters built such test facilities. And possibly multiple tests. Of course, nobody can be trusted. And, and so, <laughs> well, no, I mean, just doing one thing, one time. No, no, no. Isn't going to give you Look, a database. Um, one thing many times, according to the ergodic theorem, that's why I got a PhD, so I can use words people don't understand. One thing many times is the same as many things one time. But... We want many things many times, right? That's where this seems to be going. Okay. That's where but, the cost. But, you know, they, this all comes back to the challenge, and I'll even go into the stick build versus factory build. That discussion doesn't ever seem to carry to where does the factory come from? Well, what do you mean? So I can imagine... The for low number, I mean, you know, how many power reactors have we built? So roughly a hundred, right? Of various kinds. So of each kind, maybe 40 at the most. Uh, you're not talking what I would consider. Yeah, but we built factory. thousands of pipes and thousands yeah, of components. I'm talking, I, I, keep me on the system, like, over on the big system. Well, that's a different kind of test. I mean, that that's you're going to always, if you're going to do systems, you got to do a lot of simulation. You got to do scenarios. I mean, that's a complete, that's a very important but, point. But if you're going to talk about the reactor being factory built, the power plant being factory built. That's a good point. Now you're going to have to have. You got to be able to test the system. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. And somebody's got to pay for the factory. Right. That's I really good. You're really talking an intermediate level of shop built by a general purpose shop. Yeah. Where a guy can be doing this one day and working on an excavator the next day, and you don't necessarily build the workforce, supply chain workforce. How do you get there with limited numbers of installation? That's really good. What, what do you think the, the manufacturers who are promoting these ideas, what do they have in mind? Do they have 
shop in mind? Do they have a system in mind, or do they just have looser regulation in mind? I suspect a scattering of all. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you, they, you like my late wife. The, the answer is all of the above. So, <laughs> okay. With the enterprise, we're only building one, right? One thermonuclear reactor in southern France. We have to come up with a method to qualify the wells and the radiation. We're talking about radiation you don't even can't even comprehend in the BWR. Okay, BWR now you switch basically to the most basic level of components at this point, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay, and so we have two conversations running. One is but systems that, well, they're both important. I'm just trying to, you know, this is all foreign language to me. I'm all trying to keep it clear. So we have okay. these two different conversations. You have, have a manufacturer that's going to build the whole thing. All you have to do is have specification and drawings. We build drawings through a 3D model today. And, and we know they fit before we ever build them. And we know the tolerance is so. And, and we can build these things. In fact, you can, you, we can build them so close that they're a full tent. We even know the timing of the flanges in all of them. And, I'm sorry, what relationship does this have to testing? That means that we would build it through a specification and they would meet that specification before we would use that part. But th those are all yeah. tolerance specifications. Do you have, tolerance do you have safety specifications in mind also? Yes, that's all in the, the design package. You have to have design criteria when you start. Once you have design criteria, that is where you put your okay. basic control. You guys are doing what I asked you to do, you know, which is not... Try to think where in the world is Westinghouse going to learn how to do this, but in an idealized world, how would you go about it? And, that's how and then I keep saying, but where is Westinghouse going to get I mean, the people to do this? That's you good. Look, you look that's at good. a component for a car, you have aftermarket components for those cars after the manufacturer put bills. Yeah. And they work just as well. It doesn't matter. You're only building one car. I'm sorry. Did, if, wait, 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 wait. wait. I didn't hear the comment. It's got to be so our right. our remote people can hear it. What was said? That you're, that you're building millions of cars. That's the difference. You're not building millions of cars. You go look at, at the, uh, there's a Fort Dame IC on the cost overruns at Vogel. And the thing they found the most that was the cost overrun at Vogel was pouring of concrete. That was the most labor intensive uh, activity. And there's no way of get, getting around pouring on concrete. Every reactor is going to need the concrete containment and the large concrete walls. So you can build as many as you want in the factory. These labor intensive processes and construction are still going to be there. Let, let me pose a. You can sit down now. That's fine. Thank you. Um, uh, do you guys know who Kelly Johnson was? Was that too long ago? Okay. Kelly Johnson claimed. You know, he did drawings and he gave them to his shop guys and he said, you're going to build from the drawing. You're not going to build the old way where your foreman tells you go this way and that. And he claimed that only two, 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 uh, two workers in his whole career couldn't build that way. It turned out they didn't know how to read. So uh, I, I think people can do a lot more than 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 is expected. But let me uh, let me ask you the question this way. Do you believe that the people who are pushing commercially uh, molten source uh, salt reactors would, would be interested enough in lightening the regulatory uh, burden and having it fit, really cut to fit their need in order, would they be interested enough in a much more attractive regulatory environment to be willing to build these test facilities we're talking about to change the whole approach to manufacturing? Sid? Well, uh, I've been involved in uh, some IAEA tech meetings uh, that include people who are doing a lot of what, what you're talking about. Uh -huh. uh, Copenhagen Elect uh, Atomics, they've started out specializing on components that they knew needed more development. And they did a really good job. And now they're at the point where they're putting together systems that use these components that have already been tested. 
uh, the other point I wanted to make is if you have modular uh, smaller reactors, you, you started out saying, what about a backup? Well, if you have modular reactors, uh, you can have a number of them tied together and the ones that aren't working are being maintained or are backups. So that takes care of that. But the, the big point- But you have to have a reliability model that takes into account the redundancy and which is absolutely nothing like what we have today. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that this molten salt concept, first of all, it's high pressure, which means if you're producing electricity, you're doing it much more efficiently. Uh, the molten salt, in, well, there are other types too, but- uh, If they're low pressure. If, yeah, the, lo the low pressure allows you to build these things entirely on a, a line like they build ships. And as a matter of fact- Yeah, but are the guys who are gonna build these gonna come in and say, let's follow this up and build a uh, set of test facilities so that we can do really get really accurate parameters and do risk-based, uh, excuse me, let me stop. Uh, can, the, can our uh, Zoom uh, colleagues get in? Sure. Could yes. we encourage people who are not here also to ask questions? Yes. Uh, have we gotten any? Some in chat from what can, can we switch over to them at some point so they're not? I mean, it'd be nice to have some here. chat questions. Uh, what do I do with that? I got to read it, right? Yeah, you got to read it. Uh, Zoom keeps dropping out. Well, that's uh, that's not my uh, that's not a regulatory issue. <laughs> Well, there's some comments like Rocky. I mean, I, you know, let me just point this out. that This whole idea was crazy. I never believed when I was the NRC chairman that that um, we we had a mature industry. The first, I mean, this is sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, anecdotal, but we, we took kind of reactors that you build to put on a military ship, which have to be very small. Uh, they have to be very efficient. And if they kill a few people, military guys know about risk. And then we say, we're going to put it on land where we've got all the room in the world. And we care an awful lot. I don't want to say we care more about risk, but we have less of a statistical approach and more of an absolutist. And here it is uh, uh, 60 years later, and we're still building the same kind of reactors. So it's pretty clear that that was not the kind of technology you would have chosen had you been designing your first nuclear reactor. So Rocky, you're right on. Uh, uh, Rocky's got a lot of questions that mostly have to do with Zoom. Got any other? <laughs> Is it safe to reopen Three Mile Island? I don't know. I, I, I am pretty sure that the NRC won't let it be reopened if it's if it's not safe. I mean, so speak up, speak up. I said, the one, it didn't, the whole island didn't melt down. You've only got one reactor there. Gentleman in the back with the cap. I'm not an engineer or a scientist, so you'll have to excuse my. I trust you in that case. So. I work for the city, though, so you know. I, I Now I really trust you. Oh. I'll say at least unreliable. Um, my question is oh, I'm looking for a confirmation. I know you ask questions, and it's not polite to answer a question with a question, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, it seems that part of the issue with traditional reactors, high pressure reactors, is that not only the cost, but the amount of time it takes to get one into operation. And we are faced with um, fast growing rate of demand, as well as environmental issues, as well as supply chain about fuel and all sorts of, of issues plus advancing technology so okay what, what's the question please okay. uh, small modular reactors that could be that's an answer so look, look let me let me talk a little bit about what the problem is I mean we haven't talked about energy we talked about uh, so you can sit down that's that's fine thank you um, look I can't stand I'm, I'm sympathetic to people who stand when they don't when they don't have to stand. Um, 
if you take a look at where energy fits in, the other thing about nuclear power, first of all, it was designed to go on chips. And second, it was in a world where 95% of the electricity was base, base load electricity. Utilities got long contracts. If it took them 20 years to get their base back, they knew that people wouldn't change. Now we have a world of spot electricity. Um, it's a completely different world. The base load is uh, only a part of what we have. We have, uh, I know this isn't the most po pro natural gas, otherwise known as methane, but we now have a fuel which is uh, in BTU price much cheaper than it was before. If it is, if it's drawn out of the ground carefully, it burned carefully, it can be a relatively low uh, greenhouse gas producing, very efficient where you don't, to have time to uh, reaccrue the capital cost. So the, the role of nuclear power is very different from what it was foreseen when things started. It is to provide base load or to provide continuity to, to pair with uh, wind or, uh, uh, or uh, solar where you have very uneven uh, generation. So this whole idea of how to price and what role nuclear power plays, it, it's it's never going to be flexible, but it doesn't have to take 15 years to build a new reactor. So the whole question is not, can we get nuclear so that it plays a role of, say, natural gas at the other extreme, although natural gas has gotten cheap enough so that it can be attractive for base load or for the more seasonal things. The question is, can we get it up so that the people who wrote the order are still alive when the reactor uh, is uh, delivered? And I think that's, uh, you know, money and time both go together. So I, I think that the role of nuclear power is going to be limited under all conditions, but it's going to be a lot more limited if people don't figure out how to get it up faster and cheaper and according to a budget. So there are like two approaches. You know, one is do what we do today, but a lot better. And second is do something different from what we do today. And that's that's what we're talking about, sir. Back on what you just Speak up, please. Is there any requirement within the NRC to conduct uh, an economic analysis where you're looking at the baseline? Are you asking if there is one or should there be one? Quantitative and qualitative. I, I'm, I'm proposing, I mean, that's the one thing I am proposing, which is that the NRC mission be much more like other regulatory agencies where you, you have two goods, uh, each of which conflicts with the other one and they can be uh, balanced off. I mean, that... If you don't fix that, we're just wasting our time. Well, I want to say this. Eventually, it's going to get into the budget as to whether it's going to be economically, uh, you know, um, to go forth with this. If, 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 it, if this uh, House bill passes in some form, and if you have a commission which doesn't have Jeff Barron's on it, but other, you know, sort of more cost-benefit uh, oriented people, yeah. You, you will get a change. It'll be incremental, but you'll, you'll get a significant change. The NRC, like any organization, is it, it's, um, I mean, I don't know the current people, but I can't believe they're all that different. You got some people who've been around for a while and they're threatened by changing the way of doing business. And there are some young kids who've got a job right out of college and they think they can really know how to fix things and they'd love to see some changes. And if you, if you I mean, you would have to get, uh, when I, when I was chairman, which was 1991 to 1995, we never had, we had one vote in all that time that didn't pass unanimously. We had, I, I mean, we had a chairman who worked with his commissioners so that there was something for everybody in every vote, but we had commissioners who really tried to solve problems. Um, it doesn't seem to me that that same uh, philosophy has extended, but I know it can happen. You would need to have uh, a commission, which might be a little bit more one way on how much cost matters and another way on what risk matters, but basically we're trying to solve the same problem. I'm sure you, if you had the right uh, uh, legislation and you had an effective uh, uh, problem-solving commission, the, com the, the staff would do what you want them uh, to do. Adam, you had a question or a comment? Yeah. Um, not an engineer, not a reason. Is there an engineer in this whole crowd? Everybody is starting off saying, I'm good. I'm a public historian and museums are my game. This is all 
above me, but it kind of, it relates back to what you said and where I think Wayne was heading with his too, is that we've made a lot of correlations in this thought experiment about how can we make it like the automotive industry? How can we make it like a Clayton Homes? How do we fix the regulation to where we can have somebody to produce reactors on a mass scale and have the distributors to get them the products that they need to produce them in a factory? But with something like nuclear, it's nuclear. It's not solar. It's not hydroelectric. It's not anything else. Is it something that has the capacity for that? It's obviously heavily regulated for good reason, but is it something to where the capacity of it in terms of its regulation is maybe too extreme to where it, it won't be on the same privatized scale as Clayton Homes or an automotive industry? It'll never be a Clayton Homes, but it could be a SpaceX, you know. I mean, exactly. we, we, we're not trying to build hundreds of these things. And furthermore, you're willing to take statistics. You know, if one out of X Clayton Homes collapse the company would go out of business but uh there are analogies and they're done successfully and the question is you know i posited i stipulated i may believe that the companies and the uh, government and the congress all wanted this to happen which are all pretty much not true but if they were true i just believe that the regulatory environment could adapt to that but they need ideas and we're you know we're certainly not going to be the main source of ideas for regulation five years from now. But this is a terrific audience. You guys know a whole lot of stuff, even with only 10% engineers in the crowd. You know, you know a whole lot of stuff. And you're all interested, which is not true of every civil servant and every employee of a big company. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I know I'm I'm not going to be around to see whether it works or not, but I'm still, I'm still pretty optimistic. Where do you think the biggest regulated struggles are in terms of keeping nuclear from becoming a SpaceX? I, I would, I really believe it's a lot easier to fix new things than old things. I would basically have a relatively small effort trying to figure out how to regulate uh, factory built PWRs and put a tremendous amount of effort on making uh, MS, uh, MSRs and other low pressure things, uh, both economically and regulatory regulatorily uh, feasible. I wouldn't spend 90% of my time trying to trying to fix uh, what the NRC, well, what the industry has been doing wrong for for 50 years. That would be almost, uh, you know, the, the black swan, the 80%, 20%. Uh, you, you, you invest 80% of your funds where you know what's going to happen and 20% that's, that's really high risk. I'd be the other way around. I'd put 20% of my effort in doing better what I do today in 80% trying to figure out how to build a regulatory piece, which if the other players also were doing the right thing, would really encourage the point where we would have minimal new uh, high uh, 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 stick built high pressure reactors starting 10 years from now. Unfortunately, in that world, it's only the, so the Russians and the Chinese are building these crummy reactors. I'm not so sure I'd be very happy with that either, but even that, that is even beyond my my ability to try to figure out. Uh, all the way to back. One thing that I've wondered about is if you've got a pump in the industry that's been working, you've got a million dollars of experience, operating experience, and you want to use that same pump in a nuclear plant, doesn't necessarily have to be in QA of different qualifications. You've already proved it here. Your question is an answer. The answer is it depends. If you're going to use it the way it's used already, we need a regulatory environment that gives it credit. If it's going to be used in a different way, there needs to be a clear demonstration that the experience is relevant. But you've got to make it happen. Uh, let, me, let me see. Is there anybody? Uh, I haven't spoken. Yes, please. Uh, if you take a risk-based approach, do you think the NRC would be open to giving explicit weight to the societal risk of climate change? Yes, yes, absolutely, Un unequivocally. The guys in the NRC, they're the same kids who are going out on strike and everything else and saying we're, we're ruining our, that's, of all the issues, that I think is the least the one. The, the, the one that's really hard is risk is hard. I mean, I think people would have to use the phrase differently the way I said negatively. We 
Could we get the NRC to agree to take every single one of the regulations and put the onus on them to show why that would reduce risk in the particular situation that we care about? And if not, put it aside and go on. I, I will tell you another anecdote because I'm better at anecdotes than at engineering. But uh, when, when I was the uh, assistant secretary, the chief planner of the Defense Department, uh, the, our bosses wanted us and the military to sit down and decide what should be the forces of the United States. I said, this is crazy. They're going to want three times what we want. I'm the budget guy, and they're the military guy. But what they will agree is if I design the forces, and I should say, don't start with some theory about what does it take to have 14% chance of X, but take a specific design and say, let's uh, evaluate the risks of this design together. We can get some basis. I think you can do that. That's why I'm saying a negative risk approach where we're not saying what would be the ideal reactor that would meet a certain risk Ooh. and benefit criteria, but given a given a design we have now and given a reactor, a uh, regulatory framework we have now, what's useful and what's not useful and let's not do what the NRC is said to have done five years ago, which is to put a risk framework on top of a process framework and not replacing anything else. I think that could work. I, I, that's actually a pretty modest design. It's actually probably pretty feasible. And if the, I'm sure if the commission told the, the executive director for operations, this is, I want you to do a review towards, uh, you know, there should be a sunset, a sunset rule on every regulation. I want to review says, does this still contribute to reducing risk? And in what environment? I think that could happen. I think that's a fairly modest, quite doable proposal. I didn't think it until we came in, but none of you guys have shut it down. So I feel better about it now. We're running about time. Do we have any more? Are, are there any more uh, Zoom guys are not holding up their share or are we just not attending to them? Yeah, this whole question of ROI, you know, nobody can predict. You can't predict ROI. Nobody knows the prices. Nobody knows the demand. All we know is prices and demand change on like a two or three year cycle and reactors change on a 10 to 15 year cycle. So nobody in his right mind is going to want to invest in that kind of a world until we can get to the point where things can be done on a comparable cycle. Adam. Most of my experience with NRC regulations has had to do with the siting aspects okay. of the regulation. I, my background is related to things like water. Okay. And it does seem to me that an enormous amount of progress could, could be made by a zero-based approach to site-related regulations. See how many of them could be eliminated with a design that was capable of being plunked down on the ground at a number of different sites. We have a lot of regulations now that are related to ensuring the amount of, I mentioned it to you earlier, they're related to ensuring the necessary amount of water for a uh, light water reactor. Well, that's not, look, look. that's not necessary if you don't, if you have a different design. You, you know, design not based on that. What's and come out in all of this discussion, it, it, I did put it in, but you guys have really built on it enormously. Thank you is a regulatory regime that's designed for high pressure, thousand megawatt reactors. It can't just be modified piecemeal to cover uh, a 200, 300 megawatt molten salt, low pressure reactor. You, you really have to have a different regime. It's got to go down to the site and everything else. That, um, I, I don't know of anybody who's done any thinking about uh, what are the risk factors in a site if you're going to be putting up a low pressure reactor on that site? It's got to be fundamentally different from what we do today. We, we saw locally, the, the uh, TVA did a site, early site permit uh -huh. for, the, for the site where they want to put uh, modular reactors uh -huh. as test. And there was pushback from uh, various uh, emergency management agencies over the idea that they would not require a 10-mile evacuation zone. 
Yeah, but they have no incentive to do it otherwise. I mean, you, you can't change a little piece like that. You have to. Yeah, the local agencies didn't understand that it might not need a tenure. They understand. They understand that if you build one there and I can't prove X, I lose my job. And if not, you don't build it and that doesn't affect my job. I mean, you got to do a lot of things uh, at the same time. I think we've run out of time. We have more time. And for this question on the use of uh, industrial grade components and nuclear applications, we have research reactors here at the lab. From when I'm, the last one in existence is the hydro. Well, the hydro was built in 1961. So all the parts over there you can't buy anymore. So what we do is industrial grade qualification for nuclear use. And so we do exactly what we need to talk about. We take a pump that's manufactured today and we qualify it for nuclear use. And it's not as stringent as you would think it would be. It's you just have to Look, address all the components. most things you guys know, most things on a on a reactor site have nothing to do with the nuclear stuff. I mean, I don't remember the numbers, but like seventy-five percent of the of the risk factors were pure mechanical engineering and and the electricity was inconsequential. It's mostly the mechanical, little nuclear, and every now and then somebody said. I'd like to say that we we need to think of the big picture, and we're not we're not doing that. In order to make any effect have any effect on our energy problems, we got to build a whole bunch of of nuclear reactors. Uh, wait, wait, yes, but there are a lot of steps. Look at crazy Elon back when he used to be a sane person. Be before he started building Teslas, he built the demand for electrical, uh, elect electrically powered vehicles. He understood that you had to have changing stations. I mean, the guy who was pushing the technology took that as his responsibility. Um, if, if I were in the business of building molten salt, uh, salt reactors or any other low pressure reactor, I would be sponsoring all kinds of studies and papers to say, here's what the regulatory environment has to be like. Here's what the uh, rate setting environment has to be. Here are all the things that have to happen if, if this is going to work. But look at the great benefits to civilization that will be if they work. We can't do it piecemeal. And certainly a 87 year old guy who has no influence whatsoever isn't going to make much of a difference. Uh, this, but the guys who run the companies could, if they saw that as part of their job. Uh, it, it does. I mean, they have to be multiple reactors, but they have to be successes before you get there. And they're not going to be, they're not going to happen unless a lot of homework is done before the first reactor goes up. In order for these to make a difference, they're going to have to be mass produced. And you can put, and, and yes, a lot of companies are doing this. They're making their design such that you can build a slew of them right. a, in a shipyard type okay. situation. Uh, you, and, and in order to be any good at all, uh, any use at all to our problems, we're going to have to really crank them out. Okay, but look, and you can do we're that. talking about regulatory one, stuff. One other point. You can do this with a low pressure system. You can't with a high yeah. pressure okay. system. Okay, but let's go to the regulatory world, okay? If, if, if we ever want this to happen, that means that we have to have a regulatory system that can scale up just as the manufacturing can scale up. So what that means is, uh, among other things, you have to really have a standard design that doesn't change every time you build five more, 10 times. So what would that be? How would you set a regulatory system that truly uh, examine the production line, uh, the design, the proper risk analysis, and it built, did a lot of testing to see how close the gas built is to as that. In other words, if you're going to set up a world which could be scaled up, you got to do the regulatory changes now. You can't wait until you have those. And my question is, what are these regulatory changes? And there have been some pretty good ideas come up, but you need to have this talk five more times before you really do get down. Uh, to that point. It's from from the corrosion standpoint of, of the molten salt reactor, we could actually build what I was talking about, just a, a standard reactor and mechanically heat it 
and understand the corrosive aspect, you wouldn't have the radiation aspect, but we have those numbers from our light water reactor. Are we done? Okay, thank you very much, folks. I was sitting down. Uh, we'd like to present you with a, an honorary Friends of Orr and Coffee Cup. I would be delighted to have a Friends of Orr. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.